Well, we want to thank you again for being here tonight. And uh, our speaker for this week is no stranger to Cornerstone Baptist Church. I le just learned two new things about him. Number one, he has been in our church since day one. He spoke at uh, back, I think up in Castleton is where that, the little house was. And, uh, but he has been here about, he said, about every two or three years and uh, speaking at our church. I, I know that he's a friend of our church. But for me, he's a personal friend. Since the first time I met him and then the several times that we've had an opportunity to fellowship or be around, he has always treated me with the utmost respect. And, uh, and I've enjoyed being around him. I remember taking a, uh, about three uh, boys down to uh, see uh, Florida Baptist College when they were first starting. And uh, remember, he took us out for pie. That won me over right away. And uh, in that, and uh, uh, but uh, he's he's been a friend of our church, friend to the ministry. And the second thing I found out is he's got a good voice. I never heard him sing before, and that's a pretty good voice. Maybe he'll sing a solo for us this week. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But uh, this is. Yeah. If you if you if you've never met him, you will enjoy him. And uh, this is Evangelist Bruce Turner, and uh, I know this is God's man for this hour, for this week. And let's pay close attention to what God has to say through him to us concerning our faith, promise, missions. Thank you, preacher. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. You know, when you get old and sickly, you're thrilled to be anywhere. Amen. Some of you can relate to that, right? Amen. Well, I do love this church. I, I have been coming since the very beginning. I remember... Uh, just the, that I can't remember the setting too well, but I remember it's just a handful of people, and God sure has wrought a work over the years. And this is one of my favorite auditoriums too. I, I love, always have loved the architecture of this building, and uh, love the people here. And I am really impressed with the teenagers here tonight. Amen. That's a well. I started to say a good bunch. Bananas come in bunches, but that's a good looking group. <clears throat> of young people. We're glad uh, that you're here. And I hope that you'll uh, pay lots of attention uh, over the uh, conference because I can tell you this. What's wrong? It's not on? You're muted a little bit. I'm muted? I think. You think we don't well, they enough. told me it was on, so I just trusted them. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> it tickles. <laughs> What's the deal? Any good? It's on. We might get you a new one. All right, get me a new one. What am I supposed to do, tap dance or what? <laughs> well, while, what, huh? Just use the pulpit mic for now. While we're waiting on whatever they're doing, um, let me just tell you, my wife couldn't be here tonight. Our, our daughter-in-law is graduating from college, and so she's there, but she'll be here the rest of the week, uh, and she's looking forward to that and fellowshipping. Uh, with all her friends here as well. And so we're, we're, we're definitely looking forward to that. Take your Bibles tonight. Let's get right into the Word of God and we'll do whatever we need to do. You know, the devil's always in the sound system. It just, it's routine. It's routine. I used to say the God, the sound men were unsound men, but I don't think it's the men because I know these guys are pretty good at it. it it's, these, uh, it's these microphones. They do the weirdest things, you know. And so, but we're going to make the best of it. Matthew chapter 28, and a very familiar passage on uh, the Great Commission. I know you all know it, but I want you to uh, do what uh, Dave McCracken says. If you got one of these hanging down things, that's what he calls it, the ribbon. He calls it a hanging down thing. If you got one of those, mark it there, and then go with me to Mark. Mark chapter number 16 Mark chapter number 16, and in Mark chapter number 16, uh, we'll read just a few verses. So kind of hold both of those, and we'll get right into the Word of God tonight. Uh, would you mind standing with me for the reading of God's Word? Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation to be here. Good to see the Mitchells as well. God bless you folks, and looking forward to what God will do during this week. And so let's read our text tonight, Matthew chapter 28 beginning uh, in verse number 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. No, notice the repeated use of the word disciples and them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in Mark chapter number 16, and beginning in verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. What a strong, strong statement. And so I want to just preach to you tonight, kind of set the table for the week. And by the way, you're going to have some great young missionary couples you're going to really enjoy uh, I know uh, one of them very well, and you'll enjoy them. And so we're, we're just going to set the table tonight. What the who, what, when, where, why of missions? What's it all about? What, what, why are we here? Why are we here? Oh, I know, preacher. We just want to have another calendar event. <laughs> Not when I was pastoring. I was trying to get out of calendar events. This is an important time. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We're so excited about being in your house. And we pray tonight that you might just anoint this time. Have your will and your way in our hearts. Lord, I pray for the power of the Holy Ghost to preach your word tonight. I pray for the anointing of each heart here to have a receptive spirit to your word and ears that are open to the word of God. And, and that, Father, after this service tonight, we, we might not just be hearers of the word, but indeed we might take on uh, the truth that uh, will be given to us tonight and become doers of thy word. Now have your way and be blessed by all that's accomplished here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I, I, I laughed out loud a little bit when Brother Rick said this might be uh, one of the greatest services of the year. I wasn't laughing at his statement. I was laughing because in my notes, my introduction says, there is no greater church meeting than the mission conference. There is no greater church meeting than the mission conference. You say, well, you know, Sunday morning's awfully important. Indeed it is. Sunday night's important. Wednesday night's important. But there's nothing like mission conference week. I'll tell you why. It is when we, uh, I, I like to call it mission revival week because it's when we renew our heart to do what God has given us clear uh, indication in the word to do. And, and uh, it is a time when people uh, often are called to ministry and, and it's a time when people make their mind up to be committed to giving uh, to missions around the world. And so it's a wonderful time. It was an event just like this really in Acts chapter 13. The Bible describes the church was together and they were fasting and they were praying and they were ministering, the Bible says, to God. And the Holy Ghost of God separated Barnabas and Saul for missions. He sent them out uh, to be missionaries. And that's the kind of meeting we're in tonight. I mean, it's a thrill uh, to be part of a mission conference, to see what God might do. I've been doing a lot of mission conferences the last three, four weeks, and, and God has met with us, and, and the churches have been excited and their giving has increased and that's my prayer for uh, this week. And so what I want to do tonight is just, as I said, set the table for what is missions? What is it all about? What is the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why of the Great Commission? Let's look tonight at the who of the Great Commission. Notice with me uh, in our text, the Bible says, then the 11 disciples, that's the who, uh, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And then he uses the word them and they, them and they. And so uh, the who of the mission conference, of the, uh, uh, of the Great Commission, is that God has called his disciples, uh, beginning with the apostles, to be the ones to carry the gospel around the world. I want you to li listen very carefully if you 
don't hear anything else I say tonight. Hear this. There is no other institution that has the authority and the mission that the church has to take the gospel into all the world. And so we're here tonight to be reminded of that, that God has called us to the Great Commission. It's not a great suggestion. It's a great commission. It's a commandment of God. It's not a suggestion. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so uh, he, he calls the disciples. That's the who of the Great Commission. Now, we know this, and I want to show it to you very carefully tonight. Turn with me in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. If you have your Bibles there, let's hear those pages moving. And verse number uh, 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 28. The who of the Great Commission. It is the disciples, the apostles. And who were they? In verse number 28, it says, And God has set some in the church first the apostles. Now that's repeated in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11. So look up here just a moment. Who is it that God is commissioning to go into all the world? Who is it? I'll tell you who it is. It is the local New Testament church. You say, but preacher, you just read right here that it was the, the disciples or the apostles. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, I showed you that those apostles were the first to be set into the church. It's repeated in Ephesians chapter four and verse 11. Let me say who you are tonight. As the disciples of the Lord who have been saved and baptized under the authority of this church, you are the local New Testament church, and listen to me, you are the ones to whom the great commission is given. And I want to say a couple of things about that tonight. Uh, there, there's a, there are some scholars that have written things like this. I read just the other day uh, a very well-known name, uh, someone who authored the notes of a, of a certain Bible, and he says, there is no commission for the local New Testament church. And he says that because he believes that this was given just to the disciples. And so when they died, the commission died with them. Well, we know that's not true because Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'm going to be with you to the end of the world. And we know that the disciples didn't live to the end of the world. We know who they were. They were uh, the first church. And so God commissioned the, the church. And, and uh, we, we find that uh, in other places in the Bible. But in Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. So I want to say to you tonight, we're here because it is your job to reach the world. Amen. We're here tonight because the great commission was given to you. Uh, when he said go, he was talking to you and he was talking to me. And my, my desire this week is by the grace of God to have the strength and the wisdom of God to just drive that home into your heart tonight. God is depending on you to get the job done. Amen. I hear this all the time. I, I hear people say, well, you know, uh, there's just not much I can do about uh, the world. And so I'll just tell you this, uh, uh, I'm going to give. Now hear me, you're going to hear plenty on Friday night about giving. I'm going to talk about giving uh, the whole uh, evening, Friday evening, how we need to give to missions. But may I say to you, if you gave everything you had, it does not dissolve your responsibility to be a soul winner, to reach out and give the gospel out. When Jesus commissioned the local New Testament church, it became the duty of every single one of us to reach the world. Can I get an amen right there? Every one of us have been commissioned to reach out and win this world. So as I travel 38 weeks a year, it's my job wherever I'm going to share uh, the gospel. When I'm home, it's my job to share the gospel. When you go to work, it's your job to share the gospel. When you go to activities, it's your job uh, to share the gospel. Can I say to you, we're in trouble tonight. We're losing 5,000 churches in America every year. It is said that a thousand of those are churches like ours, Bible oriented churches at least. And I can tell you where I'm traveling, we're losing numbers and we're losing money and we're uh, losing missionaries. 
missionaries around the world and we've got to take seriously the commission of God and know that we're not just to send missionaries to Taiwan and missionaries to some island somewhere, but we are to also be missionaries, amen? We're to give the gospel out wherever we go. The who is the local New Testament church. God says, go ye, ye is the church. God has commissioned each of us in our, in our capacity as the local New Testament church and individually as members of that local New Testament church. And so the who, it's each of us. And then the what, what is the commission that God gives? You know, I hear lots about the Great Commission, that was actually a, a really neat chorus that he uh, quoted there because it is our job to go into the world, but many of us don't really know what our responsibility is. The first thing, it is to go. It's just to go. Now you say, preacher, that's not very profound. Well, it's exactly profound because it's what God gave in the word, amen? He said, go, go into all the world. And so the what uh, of it is that, that God has called us to reach the world with the gospel. I, I don't know, I know that uh, the world population is well over 7 billion people. And I can tell you this, that uh, billions of those have never yet heard the gospel while we hear it, hear me now, over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm saying to you tonight, God cannot be satisfied with what we're doing as the New Testament church. He cannot be satisfied that we're soaking it all up, but we're not giving it out, amen? And so he's commanded us to go into all the world uh, with the gospel. If you have your Bibles again, I'm gonna ask you if you would uh, just look with me at uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So God says it's not an election for us. It is a command that we go into all the world and that we preach the gospel. So the first part is just obedience to go. The second part is our message. What is our message? I want to tell you tonight that I'm heartbroken uh, at what I see around the country. We're changing the message. We're changing all of our methods, and some of our methods needed to be changed, I'll tell you that. But we, we're changing everything, and we're losing our first love for the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what are we to do? We're to give out the gospel. Listen, I'm not against rolling Band-Aids. I'm not against uh, uh, feeding the poor. In fact, let me say this to you. I go every, uh, every couple of years. I try to go to India. I spend a great deal of my time working with the indigent there and the orphanage there and working in, in the medical ministry with my friends there. I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. But all of that is for the purpose of having the opportunity of giving out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we need to know what the gospel is. If I said to you tonight, define the gospel, what would you say? You see, the Bible defines it in 1 Corinthians 15 as the death and the burial of and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me now uh, for just a moment, would you? I, I'm worried that we have stopped defining what the gospel is, that we're, we're preaching an easy believism that doesn't deal with the fact that the gospel is that Jesus died and that he was buried and that he was resurrected and because he is the Savior who gave himself for us, he made peace for us through the blood of his cross. And we're to preach that message. Now listen to me. I'm all for how-to messages. I'm all for teaching people how to have victory in their personal life, how to overcome sin in their life, how to do all of that. But everything we do must be predicated upon the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death and the burial and the resurrection. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Well, he couldn't raise him from the dead if he didn't die. The death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the only way by which men and women and boys and girls can be born into the family of God. Amen. 
I've been dealing with someone in the hospital, a uh, family member of my wife, and I've been trying to win this man. He's, uh, his days are numbered probably to a couple of weeks now. And uh, he kept saying to me, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's all right, huh? I'm okay. And finally, I pressed him a little bit and said, uh, why is it okay? You see, it's not okay because you think there's a God in heaven. It's not okay just because you go to church somewhere. Somebody help me here now. It's not okay just because you were baptized when you were a little kid and you didn't even know what hit you. You just kind of blinked when the water hit your eyes, you know. That's not okay. What is okay is that every man, woman, boy, and girl must be born again, amen? Why are we having a mission conference? Yeah, I know Brother Rick doesn't have enough to do, and so <clears throat> we're trying to fill the calendar up, <clears throat> and after all, the flags are pretty, and wow, we enjoyed it, and we're gonna have ice cream tomorrow night. Oh yeah, that's why we have mission conference. No, we have this, to fire up the base, to fire up the local New Testament church, that it is our job to reach the world, amen? Now, I, I'm supposed to be retired. I'm 38 weeks a year out preaching. I don't know how much retirement that is, but one of the things I have tried to do is even in my travels to be sure that I never take my eyes off of the goal, and that is to win men and women and children to the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? So we're to preach the gospel, and then we're to baptize them. And I tell you, in, when I pastored Westgate Baptist Church in Tampa, uh, we had a, a good sized staff because we had a church, a large school and a, and a college. And, and so one of my staff members had this job. On Sunday morning when people got saved at this altar, I used to tell him, get on them like ugly on an ape. In other words, you get right down there to them and you say, uh, you received the Lord today? Yes, I did. Uh, we want to talk to you about what the Bible says about baptism because we want to get them to be obedient to what God commanded. See, God said get them saved and then baptize them, amen? It is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but it's also a picture of their death to sin and their burial to the old life, and they are resurrected to walk in newness of life. And I'm telling you, now hear me, hear me tonight. Baptists are weak on this. You know, we, we live around uh, the, the, the Camelites, the Church of Christ, who believe baptism is necessary for salvation. My doctor goes to that kind of a church. And when I got back from India, I had a routine appointment. And she said, well, pastor, how many did you baptize? And I said, well, uh, we had bunches of folks get saved and the church will then educate them about what baptism is. Most of them are Hindus. And then they will baptize them as a step of obedience because they have been saved. Then they that gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And then God says, teaching them to observe all things. So the Great Commission is not, hey, we're sending these missionaries somewhere and we're gonna give them some money. No, it's the preaching of the gospel. It's baptizing those that get saved and then it's keeping them in the church and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever God has commanded. So I'm trying to give you the whole picture of what missions really is tonight because some of us come here, I think, I know I did for a while in my, in my youth, thinking that really all I needed to do was shell out a little money. That's really what the church wants anyhow. They just want a little money. And the truth is, that's not what it's about. That's part of it. Amen. I'll talk about that Friday. But we're to preach the gospel. We're to go and preach the gospel. Get people saved. Baptize them. And then teach them to observe all things. Let me tell you, this generation is failing drastically in training our young people up to believe what we believe. I'm thrilled to see this good group of young people tonight uh, Brother King, but I'm going to tell you something. The statistics say we're losing 85% of our kids when they graduate from high school. I saw where Lifeway, the Southern Baptist uh, publication, said that was incorrect, that it's actually 70%. Well, whether it's 85 has been proclaimed in a book or 70% as proclaimed by Lifeway, it's still unacceptable, amen? We, and, and we've got to double down and teach these young people to, to know what the Bible says. Somebody else say amen there. Teach them what the Bible says and help them to understand what God wants out of their life and why we come to a mission conference. This is not just another meeting. 
A preacher said it. This probably is the most important meeting of the year because it's the time when we address the very heartbeat of God and that's that every man and woman and child know him as Savior. Who? The disciples. What? The Great Commission. When? I love this. It is implied in the text that God calls us to do it now. To do it now. You say, preacher, where in the world uh, do you get this? All right, well, look with me here in verse 19 of our text. Matthew 28 and verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It is implied that he is saying, go now. Go now. You say, preacher, I don't get that. Well, I thought somebody might say that to me. And so I want to give you a parallel passage that will spell it out even better. Look with me in Matthew chapter number four. Let's hear those pages. Matthew chapter number four. Look at verse number 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Did they understand what that meant, that it meant now? Well, let's see what the next verse says. And they, what? Say it, church. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Listen, I want to tell you tonight, this business of serving the Lord and going out into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, it may be, it may be in your Jerusalem, we'll talk about that in a minute, or it may be around the world, it may be at your job tonight or tomorrow, but it is right now that God demands that we do this. Can I tell you, Satan, I believe, has doubled down on us today. I believe he understands he has but a little time. And I'm telling you, I'm watching families be destroyed like never before. I'm watching people fall into deep sin like never before. I'm watching preachers throw in the towel like never before. I'm saying to you tonight, now is the accepted time. Oh, today is the day of salvation. We need to get the message out now before it is too late, amen? before men and women uh, plunge into the eternal uh, lake of fire. And so when? It's now. And then you say, preacher, so where is it? We'll go back to our text in Matthew 28. I love that everything is right here in the book. In Matthew 28 and verse number 19, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Can I say this without trying to sound profound tonight? There is no bad place to preach the gospel. I have uh, a lot of young preachers who call me my, uh, when I surrendered to be an evangelist, I had no idea that a great deal of my time would be taken up counseling young men. Yesterday, I, I had more than 12 hours in my office just dealing with calls, calls for help and calls for what can I do to see the church grow and calls, uh, my wife's feeling uh, like throwing in the towel and preacher, I, I can't do it if she doesn't do it. And, and, uh, and so sometimes they'll call me and tell me, maybe I'm in the wrong place. And I told a preacher yesterday, you know, there's no wrong place to give out the gospel. You know, there's hard places. Life's hard. I pastored in New England, 85% Roman Catholic. It was hard. I mean, it took me scores and scores of times knocking on doors to get in a door. I'd make hundreds of visits before I'd get one person to even talk to me at the door. But little by little, somebody got saved and their friends got saved and their friends got saved. And when I left there to go help a church that was going under in Florida, I left 300 strong adults in that church in an area where everybody was telling me, you can't do it up there. The Catholics won't listen to that kind of preaching. I want to tell you tonight, the gospel works around the world, amen? It works everywhere. Go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 with me. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Let's see about where we go with this. We said Matthew 28, all the nations. But in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts, he said, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part 
of the earth. Can I say to you tonight, and I loved what Brother Rick said tonight, uh, the, you know, the sun never goes down on the ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Church. Somewhere around the world, you have a missionary preaching the gospel, amen? Does that not thrill your heart? I mean, anybody here? I mean, does that thrill your heart tonight? That somewhere around the world, all the time, somebody on your behalf is declaring that Jesus loves them and that he gave himself for them on the cross and telling them how to be born into the family of God. There's no bad place to take the gospel. May I warn you tonight that Christianity is falling behind and Islam is growing rapidly around the world. One, one writer says that by the year 2045, that Islam will, at the present rate of growth, be the predominant religion in America? Does that not scare you? Does it not scare you that with that comes Sharia law, which says if you're not Muslim, you can't stay alive? Let me tell you something, my friend. We better get busy winning this world, amen? And we've got a responsibility right here in our Jerusalem. Listen, this church has had a great testimony for many, many years, and you, you have that because this has been a place where people get saved and people get baptized and they get taught the word of God, amen? And you cannot give that up. And then you must send missionaries beyond this place. But right here, each of you have to be a missionary. Uh, we live in Hagerstown, Indiana. Our house is right smack dab in the middle of Amish country. I'm more likely to see a buggy go by my house than a car. And when I realized that, I had no idea when I bought the house. When I realized that, I said to the Lord, thanks, Lord, for putting me right on a mission field. And I've been witnessing, and I hear this. I, my, some of my preacher friends said, you'll never win one of them. I'll tell you that right now. But I'll tell you right now, my son and I are witnessing to several Amish people that are really, really close to becoming believers. Amen. And I'm telling you, we hope that we can break that thing wide open. And then I want maybe in the fall to have a tent revival down on my property there and see if we can draw some more into here and see what we're all about. I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is I still have a responsibility when I'm home to try to reach people in my neighborhood, amen? And you have that responsibility. Let me ask you, when is the last time you shared the gospel? When is the last time you opened the Bible and went through the, the plan of salvation? When is the last time you took a track and, and put it on somebody's door, inviting them to come to Cornerstone Baptist Church where the gospel of Christ is preached? You're going to say, oh, I've passed out thousands of tracks, preacher, and they don't work. Oh, really? I put a track out when I was in New England called How Much Time, and you'd open it up, it says, do you have and it was just scriptures on time and the necessity of salvation. Over the years, I got scores of letters from people. We printed over a half a million of them on our own press and gave them away to young preachers starting churches around America and in foreign countries. And we had lots of people respond and be saved. I remember a man in prison at Walpole in New England in prison for murder and rape send a letter and say, I received this track and I read it and I have trusted Christ as my savior. I was preaching in Cleveland, Tennessee just about maybe a year ago. The church was without a pastor. They called me and asked me if I'd come and do a revival and try to encourage unity and help the church stay together. I did that soon after they, they called a pastor and they're doing really, really great. Uh, and while I was there, uh, they had no pastor. So I was at the door on Sunday morning and I was shaking hands with people and I'd say, are you a member here? And they'd look at me like, why are you asking that? I said, I'm a visitor. I'm a visitor preacher today. I just wondered if you're a member or a visitor. This lady said to me, I'm a visitor. And I said, how'd you hear about the church? She said, well, uh, I have uh, uh, six hotel chains that, uh, that I'm the vice president of. And she said, so I'm here a lot in the area. And she said, my daughter met me here and we went to uh, Target. And she said, when we went into the ladies room in one of the stalls was a track from this church. 
She said, I said to my daughter, if they're willing to go into the ladies' room and put one of those things, I think we ought to go over and see what that church is about, amen? I preached on Sunday morning, true story. I'm telling you, she said about where Brother King is right there with her daughter. And I gave the invitation. That lady literally knocked her daughter out of the pew to get uh, to come forward, and she got saved that morning. Yes, tracks do work. You know, I was in a church in in East, uh, at Eastland Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, in uh, November, last Sunday of November. The preacher was on uh, some kind of a leave or something, just resting a little bit. And so the associate pastor said, look, you usually do one of the adult classes. Would you do the teens? I said, cool. I love to speak to the teens. That's my favorite thing to do. So I went in. There's about 60 young people uh, in the room. Y'all hearing this? 60 young people. And uh, so they did their preliminaries. And then he said to me, he said, uh, Brother Turner, he said, you know, we need uh, to take a moment and see how many contacts have been made by the teen group. I thought, well, that's crazy. There'll be five kids handed out a track. Uh, it just went on for about five minutes and they were adding it up on a computer and it was coming up on the screen and I'm waiting to see what that final figure was gonna be and when the final figure hit that screen, it was over 1,000 contacts by 60 kids. Now hear me, in the youth group that day were several visitors a result of those contacts. You say, well, what did they do? They emailed, they texted, they tweeted, they sent cards. They wrote letters. They said, personally, would you come and go to church with me? They did. They used every possibility. Here's what I want to say, and I'm not mad at anybody. I love this church. I do. I want to come back sometime. But I want to say it honestly tonight. Many of us have just plopped in the pew. I call it Alka-Seltzer religion. We just plop and fizz. We don't get anything really done. Let, let Brother Rick do it. Let Brother Mitchell do it. Let's, let, the, let the staff do it. Let the teachers do it. No, you've been called to do it. Do something. Give out a track. Send out a card. Write a letter. Make a phone call. Make a personal visit. Uh, tell your friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. Do something, amen? Thousand visits, 60 young people. I'm just telling you it can be done if you want to do it, Amen? We've been commanded to go into all the world. I'm, I'm almost done, but I do want to tell you, I've had the privilege to preach around the world. I've preached in some phenomenal places, Australia and Hungary and Germany and many other places, Africa, India. I think the most thrilling thing I've ever experienced, I was preaching in a little church in Hungary, a very small church, the pastor said to me, Brother Turner, he said, these Europeans are different. And he said, they don't kind of respond. To, you, you, you know, nobody's going to say amen, and, and they're not going to raise their hand, and they're, not, they're definitely not going to come forward. But he said, I know how you preach, and you probably expect that all. So he said, I've been training five of my people to win people to Christ at the altar. And he said, we're ready. If somebody comes forward this week, we're ready. On the very first Sunday, a man, his wife, and three daughters, he was the leader of the Communist Party in Debreson, Hungary, had been the Communist Party leader all the years of his life, came forward, all five of them, to get saved. He's now dead. I was just there in April. He's dead. His wife's dead. But hear me, all three of his girls are still active in the church there. The gospel works. Did you hear what I said? The gospel works. I was on a plane several months back. I don't know. How, how many of you fly regularly? I don't mean you fly, but you're on a plane regularly. Yeah. It's not like it used to be, is it? It's not. And, and because churches are paying for my ticket, I always get the cheapest ticket. Well, now the new thing is basic economy. You can't pick your seat. <laughs> If your wife goes, you can't sit together. That's the truth. It's crazy. And I got one of those seats, and I ended up, I looked at my, at my boarding pass. I was at 36E. It's D-E-F. United Airlines, row 36. Well, I'll tell you where it's at. It's a middle seat against the toilet. <laughs> and because I walk with a cane most of the time, I, 
I got on early and I said, I said to the to the agent there, I said, hey, how do I luck out and get such a good seat? And she said, because you buy cheap tickets. And I said, no, I don't. Brother Rick does. Now, I always blame the pastor. That's now what I'm supposed to do. I blame the pastor. I said, the preachers do this to me. And I, I laughed. I said, no biggie. I, would just, I just wondered why they always, she said, they always start filling the plane from the back of the plane. In my heart, I was like, no, 36C by the toilet. This is ridiculous. You ever been in those planes that those toilets are, they always smell bad. And then I'm a big boy. I get in the middle seat and inevitably I get two people bigger than me sit on the other side and we're just overlapping. You can't, it looks like one person, amen? It just looks like one person. Where do they all go? So I, I get in my seat like a good boy and I sit down. I said, Lord, help me not to be grumpy. About that time, a man and a woman was trying to get in their seat on this side of the plane. And there was a guy had already gotten in this woman's seat and he was, I don't know if you understand this term, but growing up, we said three sheets in the wind, drunk. I mean, he was out of it. And he said, well, that's my seat. She said, no, it, my, it says right here. He said, I'm telling you, it's my seat. And then he spoke to the man real harshly. He said, she's not sitting here. This is my seat. And boy, he's, the husband, he's getting ready to duke it out. And the lady said, no, 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 no problem. She said, I'm going to sit over here with this nice man. Me. <laughs> I'm feeling better now. Her name was Polly. She came over and sat down. We took off. Just as we got in the air, she looked at me and she said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I pulled back my jacket. I said, you can tell, huh? I said, you know we preachers like that fried chicken. Amen. I have to admit, I, I like it. She said, oh, no, no, I would never say something like that. No, no, no. She said, you just got that look. I said, oh, you see my halo? I just break in the ice with her. We went a little further, the plane went a little further, and she finally turned to me. I've never had this happen before or since that happened. She turned to me and she said, if you have a special Bible verse that you'd like to quote to me, I, I wouldn't be offended. I'm thinking, lady, you don't know what you just did. I said, actually, I've got a passage in the Bible I'd like to read to you. And I opened my Bible and I read to her John 3, 3 through 7. Ye must be born again. And if you're not, you can't enter heaven and you can't even see heaven. And she got really emotional and she said, man, I remember, I remember when I was just a young girl, my best friend in high school went to, she said, what do you all call that? It's some kind of a camp. Is it summer camp? Is it youth camp? I said, yeah, we call it youth camp. She said, my friend went there and she came back and said to me, Polly, Polly, I was born again at youth camp. She said, I never understood until today what born again meant. And I said, Polly, would you like to be born again like your friend? And the tears started to stream down her cheeks and she said, I sure would. I sure would. And I had the privilege of leading Polly to the Lord on the airplane. Now I want to say something to you. Look at me. You all think I'm a maniac because I yell. You say, that guy, he gets, he gets all fired up and noisy. Someone said to me in a church recently, why do you yell? I said, so you will hear me. But if you know my personality, you'd know me to be an introvert. Today I had to go visit my wife's niece's husband who's dying. I sat in the car shaking for 15 minutes saying, God, you know how hard this is for me. I've tried to win him before and he wasn't very receptive. I sat out there and the sweat was coming off my brow and I said, Lord, you gotta, you gotta change my personality and help me to be able just to get right down to it and, and give the gospel. I didn't get to do that because they had a medical team working on him, but I'll go back in the morning and I'll pray again. Lord, you know me, I, I don't like talking to people like this. My first time out soul winning, I knocked on the door and said, please, Lord, don't let him come to the door, <laughs> please. But I have since learned, hear me, is my responsibility. We can't just give money this week and send others. We gotta do what God 
charged us to do. Amen? In all the world. And I close with this, the why of missions. Would you go back to, I ask you to, to Mark, Mark chapter 16. I want to read Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. You know what? I took my Bible down there and I'm going back up here to read it, so I'll just come back down. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. When you're there, would you give me a big hearty amen? All right. Well, good. Now let me get there. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. Wow, what a passage of Scripture. Listen to this. Jesus has come. This is a parallel passage to Matthew 28. You understand that, right? And he says to them in verse 15, he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why do we do that? He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Say the word with me. Let's say it real loud. Saved. Say it real loud with me. Saved. If you preach the gospel, people are going to get saved. <laughs> I think God's people need to be re-informed about what saved means. It means delivered from our sin and delivered into everlasting life. We're saved eternally. But go on here with me. But he that believeth not shall be what? Damned. You know why I sat in the car today with emotion and my body shaking and my heart pumping? Is because I, I know, listen to me, I know that that man is lying up there lost. A good fella. That's the hard part. He's a good fella. And I know that every time I walk in that room, because I've preached to him pretty hard about six months ago when he's home, I, I laid it right on the line. And I know that he's probably knows I'm coming up every day and I'm looking for the right spot to pounce on him. And I am because I care for his soul. More than likely, when he passes, I'll be the one to preach his funeral. I've preached all of my wife's family's funerals, all of them. I sure would like to preach that he got saved. Amen. Amen. Because he that believeth gets saved. If you put your faith in the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, if you don't, the Bible says they'll be damned. What is damned? All those who are dead, the great white throne judgment says, all of those who were dead are going to stand before God. And because they cannot give a testimony of salvation, the Bible says they will be cast into a lake of fire. This is the second death. I'm trying to say to you tonight, missions conference is not about filling a spot. It, it's not even, it's not even, listen to me, it's not even about me coming here to preach so I can get a love offering because I'm an evangelist. It's about the world needs Jesus. And it's about the fact that you and I have Jesus. Amen? And so we're the ones that God has commanded to take that gospel to the whole world. I pray, here's what I want. We're gonna have an invitation in just a moment. My prayer is tonight, hear me now, that some will come to this altar, even some young people, and just kneel here tonight and say, God, I confess that I am part of the who of the Great Commission. I confess, I don't know what I'm gonna do about it necessarily, but I confess tonight, I'm part of the ones God has called. And I wanna be sensitive to what God wants me to do. Young people, when I was your age, I've got an old Bible at home with marks in the back. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five of friends that I led to Christ. It can be done. It can be done. I want some of you tonight to just come and say, you know what? I have family and friends that are lost. It ought to hurt you. It ought to move in your soul. I wouldn't wish hell or the lake of fire on my worst enemy. We ought to care tonight. Amen? Come on. We ought to care. Some of you ought to come and say, I'm going to do better at sharing the gospel. Some of you ought to come tonight and say, I'm going to be open to whatever God calls me to do this week. I preached in Bowling Green, Kentucky three weeks ago. On one night, on Sunday morning, we had three saved. On Sunday night, a young girl, 17, literally ran down the aisle weeping. And I heard her say to the pastor, I come tonight to just say to God, whatever you want out of my life, 
I'm giving it to you tonight. What a great thought, amen? Some of us may just need to come and say, Lord, you may be a white hair like me. Can I just tell you, I got a lot of pain in this body. I struggle. Today was a struggle. I had to lie down for about an hour just before I drove up here because I had no strength hardly to walk. And it's a struggle for me. Why do I keep at it? I'll tell you why. Because time is short and the world needs Jesus. Amen? So don't, don't tell me, I can't do it, Brother Turner. I can't do it. Do what you can. If you can't get around, use the telephone. Huh? Learn how to tweet. Amen? Learn how to text. Yeah, get you a smartphone that teach you how to do something. That's what I've done. Do whatever you can. But some of us ought to come and say tonight, I'm available to be part of the Great Commission. Amen? And then fourthly, some of you ought to come tonight and say, Lord, whatever you tell me to do financially to send others, I will do it. I'll give you this illustration and I'm finished. I was preaching. Uh, actually, I was at Heartland at the home mission conference. I wasn't preaching. I was sitting in the audience a man got up and I listened to him give his story about being in uh, the northwest uh, and uh, they were living in an old, um, some kind of an old ban abandoned mine building and they had remodeled it some and he and his wife and kids were living in that. And God spoke to my heart. He said, I want you to stand up and support him $50 a month for the next six months. And I said to the Lord, Lord, do you know I'm an evangelist? And he said, do you think I'm stupid? Of course I know you're an evangelist. I said, Lord, I don't know where that money's going to come from. And he said, I know where it's going to come from. Just obey me. I, I came home, I told my wife, I said, I know our budget's really tight. But I made this commitment while I was gone. She said, no problem, honey. God will provide it. And you know what? He did. I supported that man for a year. And, and God provided it constantly. Let's just trust the Lord to do big things this week. Amen. The who, what, when, where, and why of missions. I hope it helped to bring the picture into our minds tonight so that the rest of the week just won't be hearing some young people talk about where they're going and figuring out what you're going to give. But we might all be involved in this issue of missions. Let's stand to our feet, please. Everyone standing, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. <clears throat> As the piano get, begins to play tonight, if God has spoken to your heart in any of these areas that I've preached about tonight, I'm going to ask you, would you just start right now coming to the altar? I'm going to ask the piano just to play softly a couple of verses. We may sing a verse, we may not. Just play softly. Father, I pray you'll bless the invitation now. Help us all to just respond to your will at this altar tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are still bowed. Is God speaking to your heart? How about it, young people? Is God speaking to your heart about being a witness? Is God speaking to your heart about giving out of your revenues, out of your monies, your tithes and your offerings and your missions? Are there some here tonight that just simply need to come to this altar and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. Just let God have his way in your heart tonight. Would you do that? If there might be one here tonight, say, Brother Turner, I don't know if I'm ready for heaven. I don't know if my sins are forgiven. I don't know if heaven's my home. I don't know if I died tonight and they took me over to the funeral home. I'd be ready. I'd be ready to stand before God. If there's one like that tonight, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if there's one like that tonight that does not know that you're ready to meet God, would you just slip your hand up and let me pray for you? Preacher, I'm not sure if I died tonight, I'm ready to meet the Lord. Would you pray for me, Brother Turner? Is there one like that? Just slip that hand up real high and put it right back down. Put it right back down. Would you do that? Anyone at all? <clears throat>